Hi, from nine meters high. Ferry, get over here. Yeah, I'm, come, come, I'm, come. He's the eminence gris of aviation, of course, and he has been a flight instructor all his life. And now we are here going to perform the outside walk around inspection of the 747. Let's go. There is a lot, lot to see and inspect. What we do here, this is the, the nose view bay. You look at the general condition. You see all those boxes and all those, all those lines. We look for leakages. If there are no leakages, it's fine. Then we just go down along the nose wheel strut and we look at this and um, we have a look at the extension of the strut if you will because this this whole thing can extend we look at the torque link this is called the torque link and if this would be loose or open or we couldn't steer the airplane in that case so this is what we need as well hey captain what, what, what is this ah of course we are, we are going to fly this is the tow bar and behind this is the pushback truck this thing can pull and push a 500 ton airplane if it wants to and it's connected. We also see the wires going in and later on the guy on the nose and he is plugged in here at this station. That's he will the, ground plug in his, the ground engineer. The ground engineer will plug his headset in here and he can talk to us in the flight deck. General condition of the lights we look at. This, this is basically is, the external power. Yeah. We use a ground power unit which is a big generator that is running on diesel and that produces 110 volts, 400 hertz to power this entire airplane. And that big cable goes from that power unit into the airplane and powers the airplane. With and there's one thing that we always check, make sure that before we start taxiing, yeah. this is disconnected. It's much With this you can power it gets a very small village. messy if it's still connected. You can power a small village with this. It's amazing. A small village too. All right, so we then we start our walk around. You can power a small village with that. Amazing. How many antennas are there, Ferry, on an airplane like this? On an airplane like this, about uh, 16. There you go. All over the place. 16. On we the, have a look some at on the belly, them. some on the You top. don't you don't see the HF, uh, the shortwave antenna. You don't see it because it's in the leading edge of the tail. Right here. Look, there are no bird nests in there. This is uh, an air intake which will power and pressurize our cabin, all right? And air condition, together with the engines, of course. We're gonna have a look at the wing, Hermon. Yeah, look at the general condition. No no dents. No dents, nothing. Nothing leaking. And this here is the good old... You gotta come and see this. This is the General Electric CF6-50 yeah. power plant. Fantastic yeah. engine. Look at the general condition in it. Yeah. No leakages, nothing. You know, just on the side here, okay. Very simple explanation of how a jet engine works. Yeah. It sucks, it squeezes, it bangs, and it blows. And then you go. And that's how we move. And that's times four. That times we have, four. We have four of those yeah. things. Yeah, we wouldn't be anywhere with just one of them. One more engine to look at. You see how high it is. Have a little look at the wing tip right here. You see all those little antennae over there? Those little, those are called wick dischargers. And what they do, they discharge the static electricity electricity of the airplane. That and means if you are running, if you're flying through a, a, or close to a thunderstorm and you get a, an impact of a lightning, energy, the electricity will dissipate through the wicks. Yeah. The big thing at the wingtip right here is the is HF antenna for shortwave radio. Nowadays in aviation we do not use shortwave radio, hardly use it, but in those days these were your means of communication yeah. over the ocean yeah. and it over was China. A pain in the ass. Or, or it was a pain in the ass yeah. because you know. If you start using it, it sounded like yeah. you were in an Italian restaurant where 500 Nespresso <laughs> machines were running. One more thing. Crazy. Uh, one Insane. Mo one, one more thing I would like to point out. These big things here are called canoes and they are what they call flap track fairings. And these things will guide the flaps out. Whenever you see a huge airplane like this coming in for landing, there's an amazing amount of flap hanging out in order to curve the wing more. Complete barn doors. It's, I mean, these are barn doors. Huge. And huge. These things enable us to fly very slowly with the airplane. All right. And uh, the thing, the guards, the guard rails are called canoes. This is what I find actually the most impressive feature of this airplane, or one of the most impressive features, is these enormous landing gears. I mean, countless tires. There's a body gear here, which is steering. It can move 
This is to aid the airplane through a turn. If the nose wheel turns, like the way it is set there, it would turn left, they would actually turn in the opposite direction to aid the turn to reduce tire scrubbing, because otherwise you would get a, a huge amount of wear and tear on the tires and on the, on the landing gear. And then you have the wing gear behind you, on the left there, that is the gear that is mounted under the wing. Now, when this all retracts, those gear doors open like they are hanging here, they're hanging open, to allow the gear to move in. And that's done hydraulically. Ferry, how many tires are on this thing? 16. 16. Yeah. We have four bogies. We call this a bogey. The wing uh, bogey, these are the body gear bogies. And of course, we have two nose wheels. So in total, it's 18 tires at all, in total. And uh, you have to realize, if this airplane is going into takeoff and we go off the ground, these wheels will, and that's why we call it a bogey, they will just drop down, if you will. And then, whenever we select the gear up in the cockpit, a massive amount of pressure, 3,000 pounds per square inch, will bring this whole operation in gear. And in order to retract the landing gear, some doors have to open. These big main gear doors, they will open, those big doors, they will open to let these gears in. And when the whole gear is in, these doors will close again. And you see this, this, uh, this is like a small bedroom. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a bedroom. It's a tiny house. A tiny house. Uh, with all sorts of, of hydraulic lining, hydraulic whatever, lining right? electrical lining, air lining, you name it, it's in there. Sometimes guys in Africa would like to escape their country and they would climb into an area like this. And some of them even they survive. survived. If they don't get squashed by the gear. But the big thing is, on the ground, these doors are closed. Okay, this door is, 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 is closed. This one as well. Whenever we retract the gear, these will open and then the gear will come in and then they will close again. Mm -hmm. So what happens on the ground, these, these poor people who want to escape their country, they would climb upon a door and they would just sit and wait on it. And then the airplane would unstuck and would start climbing. The gear would be selected. These doors would open and guess what happened? They would fall out. Yeah. And that's a very bad thing. These are the brake units. On the older type airplanes, they would be made of steel. They would, if you had to abort a takeoff at a high weight and you hit the brakes and you have to stop before the end of the runway with a very heavy airplane, you would run the risk that those brakes would get so hot that the tires would either, they would catch fire and the tires could explode, but because to prevent the tires from exploding, because when they explode, the pieces of rubber fly into this and they create massive damage, they actually built in the tires a real neat gimmick. What was that? A plug, as we called it. And these plugs would sense a certain temperature and then they would autom automatically deflate uh, the tire. They melt. They would melt, the, the plug would melt and they would the tire would, be, uh, would deflate. Now in modern day airplanes, these brake discs are carbon, carbon brakes. And to give you an idea, one brake disc will cost about 60,000 euros. Small yeah. bonus one. All right, of course, uh, Herm, every airplane uh, which flies needs fuel, right? Yeah, no go juice, no go. I mean, that, that's what you need here. This, yeah. this baby here is full of Jet A, which is basically kerosene, which is a, a, a thick kind of diesel. So this fuel truck, pumps with a big hose through this panel, a single point refueling into all the tanks and it gets distributed to within a couple of hundred kilograms maximum unbalance on the left and on the right. There are multiple tanks in the wing and the guy who is doing this has also special safety procedures. He always has to park the truck this way so that he can move forward and Whenever get away in case there is a fuel spill, there is a fire. He needs to be able to get away immediately. So always face forward and be unobstructed. There cannot be anything in front of him because then he cannot move away. So that's a very 
very specific safety feature for the, the fueling company and the fueling personnel who, who performed this, uh, this procedure. Uh, one small anecdote, I once uh, with a 747, uh, we had to divert uh, from New York to a little country airport uh, north of New York. And uh, we came there, they had never serviced a 747. So the captain asked me, uh, how, do you know how to refuel a 747? I said, oh, I, I don't have a clue. So I went to the refueling panel uh, with a stair that we went up and then I had to reselect and pre-select some switches. Uh -huh. We looked it up in the manual how to do it. Yeah. And at the end, uh, we only needed 40 tons. Okay. Uh, only 40 tons. Only 40 tons. Only needed 40 tons. 40,000 kilograms. It's uh, quite a lot of fuel. Peanuts. And at the end of the day, uh, we managed to get away from that airport uh, with that fuel panel. And it's, it's high. I mean, mm -hmm. that's also about six meters, yeah. six, seven meters high, right? Yeah. Uh, amazing. Yeah. It can be done. You can yeah. even fill this wing through mm caps over the wing. Yeah. So, so say you were somewhere in an airport in the middle of nowhere, but they have fuel, but they don't have a pump. You could, with buckets, put it up the wing yeah. and pour it through a funnel into the tank. Amazing. It'd take you about three days to fuel it, yeah. but it is possible. Up there is a, what we call auxiliary power unit. It's a small jet engine, if you will. It's a Garrett TP331 engine. And this will give the airplane air, and it will give the airplane electricity. So the big hole is not to, to lose urine and feces and whatever. Nope. That goes into a big waste tank, if you will. And after every flight, those tanks are, you know, emptied by ground personnel. Very important. I mean, if this thing breaks down on the ground or in the air, that means uh, if we shut down the engines, no more electricity. Unless they plug one of those wires in uh, in the front. Uh, so, and they break down now and, now and then. Now and then APUs break down. And uh, especially for us, the biggest deal is you, you lose your air conditioning as well. And an airplane without air conditioning in temperatures like this or in the tropics, eh, nasty, it's nasty, yep. Captain Instructor Ferry, <laughs> we did the walk around. If you like this video, subscribe to Pal Farmer Aviation and see you on the next one. Thank you.